Ceiling Unlimited. Hello, Americans. This is Orson Welles. This radio show is brought to you by the men and women of Lockheed and Vega. The next voice you'll hear will be that of Sergeant Sean Porrick Ryan, rigger in the RAF somewhere in England. A uh, rigger is a sort of a groom to an airplane. It's uh, our job to keep them in shape for their bombing missions and put them back in shape when they come back. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a rare privilege and a deep pleasure for me to be able to say a kind word for what I consider a very great airplane, the Lockheed B-14. Over here in England, we call it the Hudson Bomber. It's dropped more tons of high explosives on Germany than any other American airplane. Another name for it is the Savior of Dunkirk. Most of the pilots refer to it as the maid of all work or the round tripper. We riggers and men on the line prefer to think of it as old boomerang because it always comes back. That is, with very few exceptions. I mind a night not long ago. Is that you, Sergeant Ryan? I never say no to a voice like that. <laughs> it's young Mrs. James herself. What brings you out here in the strip so late at night? I got tired waiting over at the hut and thought I'd wait here for them to come back. Me out here as lonely as a wolf on a rock. Will you sit down now and rest your pretty feet, will you know? A 500-pound bomb for a chair. A bomb? Oh, it's the best kind of a bomb, dear lady. Much better than you be sitting on it than sitting on you. Thank your stars you're here and not below in Brim in the night. All the rest of the squadron's back, Sean. After all, someone's got to be the cow's tail. Not this late. I'm worried, Sean. What time is it? Eight minutes more. Uh, you mean to say... They've eight minutes more of petrol. Is that what you mean to say? Ah, dear lady, the wind blows and who can tell? You mean if they've had all the good luck, there's still eight minutes. Luck's a poor way to say it when you consider all the thousands and millions of people who are out there with them. There are only five men in the bomber. More than five. More than 5,000. Now you're thinking of prayers. Prayers are all right. I'm thinking of deeds, not prayers. Though sometimes it's hard to figure out where the prayers leave off and the deeds begin. Take that Hudson that was scouting off the Norwegian coast, was flying low in a thick haze and struck the sea, and then bounced back into the air and arrived back home safe enough. I saw it myself. Three blades of the starboard propeller bent forward and one on the port, and the starboard engine smashed, and the bomb doors torn away, and it came back home. An old boomerang, just like your husband's out in tonight. Just luck. Good luck, but only luck. It happens too often to be just luck. Now, I have a bit of a theory about the thing, the machines, I mean. That they're more than machines, more than just bits of metal, artfully contrived to fly. Did you ever consider where they come from? They come from America, in the province of uh, California. Dear lady, the flying machine comes out of the earth, like everything else. The bomber's no different than a rose that grows out of the earth, but it wants care and intelligence in the growing. The bombers have always been there in the earth, but it wanted people to find the different minerals and weave them into metals on the loom of fire. That's what I'm thinking about when I say there's more than five in the crew of a bomber. Consider with me, dear lady, the source, all the many sources and the many hands that go to make up the harvesting of a bomber. For the bits of hard, fine platinum and the electric nerve centers of her engines, there were men in Russia whom, who moiled in the cold white waters of her mountain rivers. And in far off China, there were children gathering nuts to make the oil that makes the lacquer for the fine electric nerves of the machine. There were sea captains who carried the cargo crews that worked the ships and railway workers and teamsters and truck drivers, miners and clerks, and the men that make the machines that make the machines that, that make the machines. You get the extension. Do you see how it extends till it reaches every living soul on earth and everyone yet to be born? It doesn't leave out one. The school teacher who teaches the children so they may learn the trade that contributes its part. The shoemaker who makes the shoes so they can walk to school. The baker who makes the bread to nourish them. The women who bear these children who grow to be men. All the delicate, intricate parts blended together in the thing we call an airplane. All the products of hunger and hope. And you consider, dear lady, that all the hopes of all the little people everywhere ride with that bomber. They'll not let it fail. For when it fails, the little people all over the world fail with it. You're talking about all our bombers. Aye, and you're thinking of only one. One bomber and one man. It's the nature of a woman to think of a man. What time is it? Eh? What time is it? <laughs> Would you believe it now? My watch has stopped. There's plenty of time yet. His tea's getting cold. Now, take tea, for instance. Have you ever considered tea, dear lady? What a wonderful thing it is. I mind the winter when I was a boy coming home across the bogs. You keep the trail in the bogs. One little error of judgment, one misstep, and maybe they'll find your cap in the morning, but likely nothing at all. The world goes on. I don't know how I can face it. 
We were considering tea and not me drowning the bog, for I didn't, as you can plainly see. I'm far too solid and noisy for a ghost. Now, when I was a lad picking my way home, the shirt on my back heavy and stale with sweat, and the marrow drawn out of my bones from the hard work I'd been doing, my mind would run ahead of me like a hungry dog and smell the tea brewing in the brownstone pot. And then my mind would run back like a dog again, and I'd smell the tea in my very nose. <laughs> it had put a wing in my heart. And yet, before I could get that cup of tea, men had to learn how to make ships and sail them and to cut forests and fashion trees into strong timbers, and other men had to go and search out the far places of the world and find the herb and bring it back, all for a wee cup of tea. Said, so you consider, dear lady, that I was not walking the bog alone that night. The world walked with me, and the world helped my mother brew that cup of tea. Just as the world is flying with your husband tonight. Please tell me the time. I can hear your watch ticking. It hasn't stopped. Hi, dear lady. My watch can't tell you the time, for it can't measure the winds. They'd had fair winds coming back from Bremen. There's still time. We never give up, you know, till we're sure. And then we don't give up. The rest of the squadron's given up. I could tell when I stopped by the hut. Casual is the word for Mrs. James, lads. Tell her about the new Mickey Mouse film of the Crown this week. Then dress her in crepe with your worried young eyes. Ah, oh, no, no. <laughs> Oh, Sean, it's no good pretending. This is it. I know it is. I've been expecting it ever since the war first started. But I didn't think I'd behave so badly dear, when it did come. Dear, dear lady, come now, come now. What's that? The searchlights over the Firth are groping for something. We'd better stand over here in the lee of the revetment. Maybe a German. I don't hear the motors. Nor I. Maybe they found a way to silence them. It's coming this way. There goes light 14. He's on it. Can you make out the silhouettes? No, I can't see anything, but it can't be. We'll know in a moment when our light hits it. And there. They got it now, Mother. God, dear lady, it's our Hudson coming back on a dead stick, gliding back to her own runway. That's the recognition signal breaking now. Look, dear lady, can't you see it? I can't see anything. My eyes... Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. Can't a mother blackbird pick out her own in a flock of a thousand? Oh. <laughs> it's the old boomerang come back home again. It always comes back, dear lady. They're circling into the window. Oh, dear. Ronnie will be put out. His tea is as cold as his stone. That was a story by John Tucker Battle called Mrs. James and a Pot of Tea. The dear lady was Miss Agnes Moorhead, and the rigor was played by your obedient servant. John Steinbeck wrote a story for this program. We think it's one of the best things we've ever had a chance to do on the air. It's a very short story, though. So short, we've had to wait for another story short enough to give us room for it. I'm very glad that we found time for it this week. You're going to hear it now. It's called With Your Wings. He knew most of all that he wanted to go home, that there was something at home he had to get. He didn't even know what it was. During the long, hard training, there hadn't been time to think of himself nor to want anything. The ceremony at the end was unreal. He stood with 16 others, all of them rigid as cypress logs, and the silver wings were pinned to his blouse over his heart. There was a speech by the colonel. The half of his mind heard it. The other half was going home. He walked to his Model A Ford, got in, slammed the door. From the corners of his eyes, he could see the gold bars on his shoulders. The silver wings were heavy over his heart. He started the clattering open roadster, listened for a moment to the slapping pistons, and drove away in the sunny golden afternoon. The front wheels waggled loosely. He let the steering wheel slip back and forth in his hands. The training plane flew over and banked. He glanced up, 
and knew that the pilot was not going home. Now he was frightened of his success. He tilted his cap a little, and sat very straight behind the wheels. Then he turned off the highway into the rutted lane. The meadowlark flew ahead from fence post to fence post, singing his coming like a herald. The young cotton was strong and dark and clean in the fields. The porches of the cottages were crowded as he drove by. Children washed and dressed in their best and starchiest clothes, hair bursting with ribbons. The older people standing behind on the porches. At each house, they watched him pass. And then the families walked solemnly down the steps into the lane and followed him, like people going to church men and women and children in their best clothes. He could see them in the sun-cracked rearview mirror, moving into the lane behind him. His own folks were standing on the porch waiting for him. His father in white shirt and black string tie and dark church clothes, his lean chin held high, his mother in her blue and white print dress each hand in front of her, holding the other to keep it from escaping. His grown sister, pretty and breathless, her lips a little open. His young brother, with eyes so wide that his forehead wrinkled up. Second Lieutenant William Thatcher, stopped his car and got out slowly and moved slowly toward the porch. And the gathering neighbors came up behind him. He'd planned how it would be. He'd treat the whole thing casually, as though it were nothing at all. He'd planned to say, Hello, Pa kiss his mother and sister, pick up his little brother and tousle his hair. But it wasn't like that at all. It wasn't nothing. It was something. He walked slowly toward the porch and stood looking up at his father. He could hear the rustle of the neighbors as they moved silently near, formed a half circle behind him. It was as though his own people were sitting in judgment on him. The sun was warm on the porch and on the roses against the porch, and the sun was hot on his golden shoulder bars. He could see them shine from the corners of his eyes. He'd thought to come home in triumph, and it wasn't that at all. He took off his cap with a gold eagle on it, held it in his hand. He saw his tall father lick his lips. And then his father said softly, Son, every black man in the world is going to fly with your wings. And then he knew. His breath caught sharply against his throat. He climbed the steps and went blindly past them and into the house and into the bedroom where he had grown up. Lieutenant William Thatcher lay down on the white bed. His heart was pounding. He could hear a little quiet murmur of voices in front of the house. He knew they were going to sing in a minute. And he knew now what he was to them. This program has come to you from the Lockheed and Vega Aircraft Corporations of Burbank, California. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>